Housing is a fundamental human need. Constructing that housing is often a complex undertaking that requires understanding, patience, skill, and foresight. Developing affordable housing can be challenging for sure, but the reward can truly change people's lives. And for that, it's totally worth it. Let us explore that journey with the folks doing this important work. This is Housing Development, a practitioner's view. In this episode, you will learn about structuring the deal, assessing assets, and investment resources. Let's meet our panelists. Hi, my name is Lily Gray. I'm a director at National Development Council, uh, which is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing the flow of capital into low-income communities nationwide. My background is in affordable housing development with a strong focus in finance and policy work. Uh, I've worked in a wide variety of roles in the public and nonprofit sector, as well as the private sector. Um, and in my current role, I assist government and nonprofit clients to further their community development objectives. My goal with my clients really is to increase their capacity to deliver meaningful results in their communities. And my passion lies in the belief that communities are stronger with affordable housing as a big part of the, the solution. Um, in terms of my uh, goals today, I think that HAI Group is doing phenomenal work of trying to build the skills of local housing practitioners to increase the, this great work in the communities, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. I'm Jim Harbison. I'm the Executive Director of the Metropolitan Development Housing Agency in Nashville, Tennessee, where we're responsible for 13,700 families of low income and are very focused in developing our communities to build a better Nashville and provide everyone the opportunity to move on their lives and fix and remediate concentrated poverty. I'm happy to be here today with you to discuss the uh, possibilities for development across our country and look forward to our conversation. Hi, I'm Celia Denise Smoot. I'm Vice President at National Affordable Housing Trust and I've been doing affordable housing and affordable housing finance in particular for about 20 years. I started my career early on as an attorney with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development um, in the Philadelphia office. I am focused on transactional work and even more specifically working on HOPE 6 and mixed finance, uh, public housing transactions, um, working with housing authorities in that region to close their um, uh, redevelopment and uh, recapitalization projects of public housing assets throughout. Excellent. Now, let's get underway. I know at MDHA in Nashville, one of the key uh, and probably most important thing we have to think through on the, at the very start is what the vision for the agency is. What's our strategy? And from that, everything else sort of flows. Um, so what factors and uh, how do you see uh, sort of the vision and the front end analysis that goes in with your strategy as it relates to development? For a lot of the housing authorities we work with, it means it's clearly very important for them to be thinking about their plan in a holistic and comprehensive uh, view. Um, the idea of thinking about their development activity as one project at a time could be, um, in the long run, not the uh, most productive way for them to, to go about the process. Um, what happens is that as you start looking at your portfolio over time, you'll realize that there are other factors and other resources that are incredibly important to deciding what project goes first, what project goes next. And so that vision is not only about what we want in the end, um, how we want the portfolio to sit, how we want it, how we want this kind of comprehensive kind of neighborhood revitalization to happen around the housing authority's portfolio, but also the timing becomes very important, and thus that's where you want the vision and get about the overall timing and the comprehensive picture of the portfolio is important. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that um, there's a huge rush that organizations sometimes feel to get these projects done and get started. Um, but I always encourage our clients to really focus on spending time up front to define their parameters of what makes sense for them as an organization. And that is gonna be different for each group uh, based on the capacity that they have, um, their portfolio, their financial picture, 
the staff that they have on hand. Um, and I think that a, a really important part of that early stage of visioning is really bringing in the leaders of the organization across departments um, to strategize and talk through different models and what makes the most sense. Um, and really be able to kind of define that box that they want to operate in. Of course, you guys know that a lot of times you end up outside of that box, <laughs> but I think yeah. that uh, defining it is helpful regardless because then that helps you to really assess where you might run into some risks when you step outside of that comfort zone. Well, and what we found, um, it's not just the uh, organization itself. I mean, MDHA has a great deal of land and it's pretty integral to the city. So we had to bring in not just our own staff, we had to reach out to the community and reach across a lot of, uh, a lot of boundaries, uh, both community building, you know, faith-based groups, of course, mm -hmm. uh, organizations, uh, state, federal, HUD, and uh, local, uh, to sort of shape where we're going. And it led to some unique conclusions, uh, but I think you really hit the nail on the head. Everyone is a little bit different and what works in Nashville won't work in other parts of the country, but the concepts are the same. And so uh, maybe if you give me some ideas of how you look at, you know, how you do your analysis on your mission and with the goals of the organization. Most, I think, housing authorities start fundamentally with providing housing as their core. Uh, we saw that as an opportunity to really be more than that and to really look at how we can rem remediate concentrated poverty and move to this mixed income model. Mm -hmm. um, and and through, through the key part of the repositioning and the RAD uh, portfolio transformation, which isn't for everybody, um, but uh, it really provides an opportunity. So I was wondering maybe how you provide advice to clients and what your thoughts are on how you shape those goals and concepts as part of the larger fabric of the community. Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. question. I mean, I think that part of it is getting, having an understanding of your local landscape. Um, and how your housing authority fits into that. And I think that you know across the board, um, nationwide, housing authorities have really filled that very deeply targeted affordable housing niche, which is, which is so important. Um, and so I think it's looking at, you know, from an income perspective, where are the gaps and who do we need to serve, but also who does it make sense for us to serve based on the resources that we have. So I think that that's a starting point for sure. Um, but in our work, you have to be cognizant of the financing resources that are out there. And so it's a blend of what makes sense for your organization based on mission and your own resources, but what makes sense based on the financing resources in your community. And a lot of times, as you know, um, the tax credit program that's administered by the state and your various local subordinate financing sources are will have specific scoring thresholds criteria based on populations and project types and that leads you in a direction too. Um, so it's sort of threading the needle of what you want to do as an organization that makes sense for you and what the financing resources are that are out there and trying to marry those. I think the other, um, the thing that I found um, incredibly compelling for a lot of housing authorities when they're looking at what they want to do in the long run, like what is their true, true um, uh, uh, end game in their, a lot of their comprehensive development. And the housing authorities, like your housing authority, just kind of looked at um, the, the, looked at the kind of portfolio repositioning and conversion actually as an opportunity um, um, and not just a task, I think has been very important. Mm -hmm. And trying to grow their mission in terms of not only thinking about just the physical structure, but also how, what the programming and ways they can partner and ways they can build in more kind of comprehensive integrated services and programming mm -hmm. for the residents and the ways to basically get the resources for that and utilizing the development process as a way to catalyze, to create the partnerships and so some of the funding to allow them to, to, to fund those kind of programs. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly agree. I, you know, vision without resources is delusion. <laughs> um, yep. And uh, for us, uh, thinking through how we were going to develop and grow the portfolio in a business model that made money was a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, because public housing agencies tend, especially the public housing model, not to be able to think that way. Uh, you're sort of constrained by the budget and what it gives you. Mm -hmm. um, once we had repositioned, we had the assets of the land, we had to do a very deep asset analysis combined with what we thought our business model would be and then line it up with what the community goals were. That led to us having some you know, pretty unique conclusions. I think it was unusual for the city to take on some of the things we've done. Um, but uh, what resources would shape 
uh, that in-state goal. Beyond, you know, the, obviously the, the tax credits to get the money to build it, you've got the asset of the land. But how about the back end? I mean, how do you look at the business model on the back end? Um, I, think that's, I think that's as important at the very start of the analysis is knowing where you want to end up. So what thoughts do you have on, on how you think through to uh, what kind of property management we're going to do? Do we want to do mixed income? Do we want to grow, get into the market rate business? Do we want to do some commercial? Um, do, you, do you have advice for maybe some of the housing authorities how to approach that? Perspective. I, I, I always say that start with the perspective that as a housing authority, you are, and, and, and quite frankly, in a lot of uh, communities, you tend to be the largest landlord in the city mm -hmm. yeah. um, or in your community or in your county. And, and those assets that you have are true real estate assets, and they should be functioning um, in, um, in, the, in the same way that other real estate assets um, function in the marketplace. Um, with the with, with the overall wrap around it um, for to this this goal of creating this housing for um, f cre creating this affordable housing, and so with that being said, I w would usually work with our housing authorities to look at every single piece of their um, assets as true real estate assets and think about ways that you leverage those assets. And given they still will remain even after the conversion, I know this is definitely an issue that comes up a lot with some housing authorities. These assets still remain public assets mm -hmm. um, and, and for, for the goal of providing affordable housing. However, the ability to allow you to look at this actually to leverage other resources, to leverage the fact that you know housing authorities tend to have um, um, at, uh, buildings and improvements that are on large swaths of land. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of a lot of underutilized land on the housing authority sites ways that you can leverage that for either doing new development, uh, using the value of that land to support your development activity. Um, definitely ways to look at that is important. The other option I would say is, is, very, is looking at your overall kind of asset and property management uh, functions and your kind of business plan around those two things. Um, I see for a lot of the housing authorities that I worked with over years, I had, you know, just that did a lot of Hope Six and mixed finance development, you know, they're now looking at um, those portions of their portfolio because for years they've been third party property managed. Mm -hmm. And now you're kind of looking at this holistic picture and realizing that that's, that's a business model that's useful for a housing authority to look at and to kind of grow their own kind of bench and capacity to take on that work. Um, but also, like, what does it mean to do that? And what's the right type of training and staffing that's necessary in order to kind of take on that different business line? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, Celia, you're right that it starts with a fundamental understanding of what you have. Mm -hmm. um, and that is both kind of your human capital um, as well as your land and financial resources. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that there's a tension in, our, in the affordable housing industry, right, of, of being focused on the bottom line, like that's not aligned with your mission, when in fact, if you're really going to increase your impact, you need to be doing something that's financially sustainable in the long run. Um, and that really is looking at your portfolio in the long run, which housing authorities have the luxury of really being able to do as long-term stewards of those assets. Mm -hmm. Um, and that long-term view should really influence all of your decision making and that's what I advise my clients of, you know, a deal might work year one, but you need to be projecting it through yeah. mm -hmm. at least 15 years, way more than 15 <laughs> years is what I advise them, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really matter if it works in year one. And I, I think that that is a critical piece of really understanding the long-term decisions that you're making in terms of the type of materials that you're choosing, the sites that you're choosing, are those sites that are near the rest of your portfolio where you can have cross-staffing alignment um, and really thinking about what is it going to take to manage these properties? Or is this a property type that is in your wheelhouse or not? Um, and really thinking through those decisions because what you don't want to get into a situation is five years down the road you have a property that you can't really effectively manage and you're losing resources on that because that impacts your ability to further your work and mission in the community. Um, so I think that, yeah, kind of getting back to what we were talking about a little bit before, um, it's, it's really important to set those goals and criteria at the outset of what you're willing to do in terms of your organization for your growth. Um, so you're not making these kind of game time decisions that could be um, detrimental to your organization. Well, I couldn't agree more. The, uh, the need is you've got to take a long-term view 
And for us, it really became a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. So you went from thinking very short term to thinking long term, focusing on how you grow your gross revenues, how you control your operating expenses, generate good net operating income, and then use that additional cash flow to reinvest. That was a real shift for us. Um, but that basic due diligence in business, establishing the long-term vision, knowing that you uh, can meet that vision because the resource you have in hand is an essential part, I think, of what we're all talking about. Um, and I'd encourage all housing authorities to really think through that um, because without that, you may not be, as you said, in a position four or five years to preserve the assets that you've been, the, you've been tasked to be the stewards of. Well, out of our strategy analysis came some uh, very specific uh, approaches to how we would uh, look at our portfolio and our long-term vision. But MDHA is pretty large. It's one of the larger housing authorities. So I think for our colleagues out there, and, the ho and housing authorities are not quite as large, um, again, the concept's the same, but your conditions will be you know, very different. Your staff is smaller. Uh, you're dealing with the fire drill at the moment, and you're dealing with the immediate, and you sometimes don't have time to think about the important. But I'd encourage everyone to take that quiet moment and try to come up with their strategy. What we found um, was that we could take advantage of the repositioning and really change our community. Our sites, uh, not by intent when they were built, had turned into, six of them had turned into really, uh, really not great places to live. High concentrations of poverty. Uh, of course, if you're qualifying for low-income housing, you're going to be of low income. Um, and with that brought people preying on our property, preying on our residents and properties, which meant high crime. Um, we didn't have as great an educational system as we wanted there, and there wasn't much economic opportunity. So one of our main focuses was remediate concentrated poverty. Okay, so now how do you do that? That sounds great, right? Yeah. We'll yeah. wave the magic wand and remediate concentrated poverty, and everyone will hold hands mm. and sing Kumbaya. Um, no, we had to do it through development, and we, we chose a model called mixed income, mm -hmm. And our model is apartment A is someone pro, uh, previously of public housing and low income. Uh, apartment B right next door is what we call workforce, mm -hmm. the 80 to 120 uh, area median income uh, resident, firefighters, nurses. And then the apartment C is, uh, is market. Mm -hmm. And that market rate uh, apartment gives you some revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, the workforce is a little bit more challenging because you've got to peg those rents at a workforce income. Mm -hmm. And then you can find low income housing tax credits, uh, HUD preferred loans, Community Investment Tax Credit, CRE, all the alphabet soup of development will cover your low-income stuff. Um, but that really worked for us. Um, and then the other thing was um, <laughs> we needed money. That's the only way to put it. You, know, you needed money. So what can we do as an agency to grow our revenue? Well, we went heavily into property management. And uh, almost by serendipity, we found ourselves in the parking business mm -hmm. because we had a lot of land. <laughs> some of it wasn't being used. Mm -hmm. A surface parking lot was relatively easy to get done. It didn't cost a lot of money, and it became a cash cow. But now that's a little bit out of the box. So why is the housing authority running you know, 3,000 parking spaces? Well, because you make almost seven figures in profit a year, mm -hmm. and you pour it right back into your agency. But it was those conclusions that were unique for us in our locality because some very unique conditions. The city and the county are one government, so we have the whole county to play in. Mm -hmm. And we had some land that was in very high value areas that wasn't being used. Um, I think for smaller housing authorities, or ones not as big as MDHA, you've got to really look at your local conditions. But in every case, you have an asset. You have land. And as they say, you're not making any more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would encourage everyone to look at that strategy, look at your assets, see what you can do to your community, because the idea to me is every citizen or public regardless of income, regardless of their background, uh, what their preference is on a lot of things, they need that chance to move forward. That's what the promise of the republic is. And to get there, I think that's what our housing authorities can do, by transitioning and thinking about what the future is and how they redevelop. And I've said a lot, I just uh, would solicit your thoughts on how uh, smaller housing authorities, I think primarily, mm -hmm. um, most of the larger ones are going through repositioning and have the staff to do a RAD type conversion. But how should they approach the specifics of looking at their uh, internal conditions and coming up with a strategy that is material, finite, and achievable? Yeah, I would say this is something where, especially with the smaller housing authorities out there, um, it may be that in the early stage a partnering approach uh, is going to make the most sense, especially on the development side. Um, so then that, again, is kind of lifting your head out of the sand and thinking about who are some organizations in the community that make sense to partner with um, where it could be a win-win. 
Um, and I think it's recognizing the strengths of, of you as a housing authority. You're bringing a lot to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I think that sometimes organizations don't have a great understanding of just how much value having the land, having the assets, um, having a, you know a, usually some sort of a property management and asset management arm to begin with um, brings to the table in the development process. So don't sell that short by any means. Um, and there's a lot of value there. And those partnerships can take a variety of, of forms. It could be um, a organization that already does development work, um, and they're really helping you kind of get through that learning curve of the development process. It could be working with another mission-oriented organization, like a faith-based organization. I've seen a lot of partnerships with, um, with churches and housing authorities, as well as school districts and housing authorities. Um, so I think partnering is definitely an approach. I don't know, Jim, is that something that you've done on any of your sure, early we, work? Sure, we have a good deal of public-private partnerships. Um, getting that balance between what the private uh, developer needs uh, and what the public agency needs is always, a, mm -hmm. it's always an art form. Mm -hmm. And it can be very competing aims. And so I, I would just say as a cautionary note, do your due diligence on your partners. Make sure you know who they are. Mm -hmm. Check their references. Check their background. Absolutely. And again, if you've got your strategy in mind, you know you're going to redevelop a site, and so we'll sort of do a notional hypothetical. You've got a site, um, and it may not be very large. Perhaps you could do it yourself. That's where you do the analysis on your own profit and loss statement on your budget. Can I bring in one more full-time equivalent, someone to do the assessment for me on a contractual basis? One choice. Mm -hmm. Can I go out and get a private partner? Now, if the private partner's coming in and you're putting the land on the table, you want him to bring cash to the deal, yeah. right? That's what you're looking for. Right. And experience and an open book. Mm -hmm. You know, no behind the curtain, I've got my profit, I can't tell you what's going on. Uh, we were always uncomfortable with, uh, with those developers who wanted to approach it that way. Mm -hmm. And frankly, some of the developers came to us, looked at us as a pigeon. You know, we're a housing authority, therefore you must not know what we're doing, right? Yeah. So they, they looked really good to them and you start to dig into it and realize this thing is a false profit. It is not going to get us where we need to be. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what have you found uh, in some of these development public-private partnerships and how best to get started? I would say, um, in terms of especially the smaller housing authorities, I really found that the best um, outcomes for smaller housing authorities were really when they looked at their kind of overall community, including their um, um, local um, local government partners. Mm -hmm. um, this becomes um, using the smaller housing authorities or also in smaller communities and which the housing authority asset is quite frankly some of the larger um, um, uh, assets in, the, in that particular community and the local government partner becomes instrumental to trying to achieve whatever long-term vision that you have with recapitalization or um, uh, uh, kind of restructuring of any community in which those public has, housing assets sit. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, the places where we've helped, where places where we've seen smaller housing authorities really be able to not only bring in kind of that, that third party development partner, um, but it also helps when you have your other type of local government partners and um, local leadership in place that allows you to see the housing authority then has a much deeper bench. Mm -hmm. And as they are engaging with those kind of outside partners, they're not necessarily situated in the community, which tends to be the bigger developers, are not situated in those communities. Um, they, ha they, they come with a much stronger positioning power. Housing authorities have an incredible amount of resources and the ability to leverage um, in the community. Um, they may not always know what, what resources that they actually have. They may not always be optimizing those resources, but they do have them. Um, I would like to think about like certain examples. One uh, good example is that as we're working with a lot of housing authorities, we've been working with them about their ability to issue bonds. Um, they're you know, issue tax exempt bonds, um, and especially with 4% executions, not only for their own development activity, but as a partner with other development, um, other developers for non-public housing assets, um, and what that means for them. Um, the revenue earned from those bond issuance and that bond um, that bonding activity as well as a partner um, in those developments because there are other uh, other advantages that um, other developers get from working with housing authorities 
such as having a housing authority as a partner could mean uh, tax abatement or, um, or, or, or pilots for that other development. And then the revenue earned from those activities can be leveraged into their own development activities for the public housing assets. Yeah, I think that's a really good way of, of looking at it is mm -hmm. what do we have already at our disposal that puts us at an advantage in um, repositioning um, our assets. And I think that property tax abatement is a huge one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in many states that is a make or break factor and whether a development will work. Um, and housing authorities have an advantage there for sure. Um, I, there are other, um, some states have um, a preference for nonprofit and housing authority agencies as sponsors of projects, which has led to some great outcomes mm -hmm. of, of partnerships that I've seen um, evolving um, in several states. Um, but I think like we talked about, it's getting a sense of what are your assets? And I think you hit the nail on the head of saying at a baseline level, um, that is step one. What are your assets? And that is, what is all the real estate you own? Um, how is that real estate performing? Are, um, are you using um, budgets that are um, general format for the real estate industry or are you using antiquated budgeting process? Um, what is your infrastructure in terms of tracking revenue and expenses? Um, and really drilling down on that to your portfolio and seeing what is and is not working today and what your true financial capacity is as an organization. Um, I think that really is kind of step one um, of getting a sense and, and knowing the value of your land, um, having your, a sense of what's going on in the mar your market, your local real estate market, how much is land worth, um, how much, what's the value um, of multifamily land. Um, and I, I think you've got to be able to know that value um, to, to make the most out of your opportunities that you have, whether that is developing your properties on your own, um, whether that's working with partners and potentially pursuing a long-term ground lease model where you would continue to own the land um, and another entity would own the building, um, which, is a, which is a common structure mm -hmm. um, that I've seen. It's um, very popular in the Hope Six Mix Finance. Um, absolutely. Um, and continues to be, I think that, um, you know, it sort of solves for the concern of giving up control. Um, and I think that there's, there's ways to craft mm -hmm. ground leases to really work um, in for what your objectives are. Um, if it's something where you don't have the capacity to do the project on your own at this time, um, but want to make sure that you have opportunities down the road and, mm -hmm. and stay involved in the deal. Um, I think that another really key piece, of course, is your vouchers and how you think about um, utilization of those, um, both in terms of tenant-based and, and project-based. Mm -hmm. um, the project, the ability to project-based vouchers, again, is one of those financial tools that can make or break, break projects. And uh, it can't be taken lightly um, how important that is, especially in creating deeply targeted affordable housing. Um, don't forget your people. I mean, the people internal to your uh, organization and have skill sets, <coughs> excuse me, that you may not appreciate. Um, I would encourage everyone to think first about doing everything they can with their own staff. Um, and that's something you don't always think of. Obviously, the land is your biggest one right off the bat. You've got to get control of it. That's the point of repositioning, really, is you get control of the asset. Uh, for us, what we discovered, um, the programmatics, I mean, the next big box would be programmatics, and there's a long list of these, but if you convert, you have a thing called the operational cost adjustment factor, where you increase your revenue for inflation every year. You now can do predictive analysis of long-term budgets and predict your cash flow and plan your long-term developments on the cash you will make in the future. It's one of the advantage advantages of repositioning. Also, uh, at least for us in the many states, the housing authority is in charge of the redevelopment districts and a thing called tax or committal financing. Another alphabet soup type thing, but it's really valuable to a private developer. It's essentially free money to him. You can't use it because most housing authorities don't pay much property tax. So there's no increment, but the developer does. And ground leases can go both ways. Not another topic. Mm. We're ground leasing from a nonprofit and we'll own the building to expand our portfolio. Uh, we also have ground lease land to others to build on. So yep. that, can go, that can go both ways, and each of those you need to analyze pretty carefully. I'd also recommend that you think a lot about making sure you've got very sound legal advice so you stay within the lanes, 
the last thing you want to do is get all excited about crafting a deal and then find out that there's some arcane structure in your state or elsewhere that sort of ties your hands. So your legal advice is, cr is critical among the assets to consider. So land, your finances, your programmatics, your own staff, and then make sure you've got your head around uh, whether you're right in line with the legal compliance requirements so that you don't get, you know, you can get off the, you can get off the dot and put a lot of man hours in a project and find out, oh my gosh, you know, here in, here in, this, in this one instance, you cannot do this one thing. Mm -hmm. And your whole structure of deal is set up for it. So legal advice early on is, is critical. And I'd, I'd say those are probably the things I consider the most. Well, every project is different. Mm -hmm. um, there's a similar capital stack that you're looking at for for each deal to make it work. And so I think, you know, the major pieces, elements of that are conventional debt, um, which is the mortgage that can be supported by the net operating income of the property. So revenue, less mm -hmm. expenses, um, tax credit equity, whether that is 4% or 9% program. Um, and in most cases, there's still a pretty big gap after that. Mm -hmm. And so that on projects could be anywhere from one to even 10 resources um, that you're patching together to fill that. Um, often that is local subordinate um, loans, which are you know long-term, often very favorable terms. Um, it also can include philanthropic sources, which mm -hmm. is a, luckily something I see growing. Um, yes. And that's been a really interesting trend in the industry of seeing non-traditional housing players entering, whether that's healthcare organizations, um, educational organizations, um, corporate philanthropy, um, and so that has been um, a pretty, pretty interesting and recent surge um, that I hope continues nationwide. Um, so that's kind of your general um, set of resources that you're going to be looking at, and I think you know something that's important for housing authorities to think about is how do you get a, a lay of the land of these resources, and a big part of that is just getting out there. Um, and networking, um, meeting with banks and financial institutions, talking to equity investors, mm -hmm. for sure talking with your local financing partners um, is a really big piece of it. So I don't know, Jim, if that's something that you feel like is a big part of your job of, of well, doing Well, sure. Some of that. I mean, we've learned the whole, alf uh, learned a good deal of the alphabet soup of, you know, Fannie and Freddie and mortgage-backed tax-exempt loans and tax-exempt bonds and HUD insurance programs, community investment tax credits, and the list goes on and on. I would say what we found as we did our first couple, we did not have anyone that operated on our fiduciary, in, solely in our fiduciary interests. Mm -hmm. The banks, while they were great partners or you know whoever the lending uh, advisor was, they're operating in their fiduciary interests because they have a business and they have to make money. So what we did, we put out an RFP and hired an SEC registered municipal financial advisor who works solely for us. We bring him in when we need him, and he's the one that puts the sanity check on, on everything. So we've gotten really, I think, pretty skilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you said, you sort of muscle your way through it, and you have to learn it through networking and attending seminars. Um, but even, at the, even after you've done that, you want that third party that is working from your seat in the stand solely. Uh, without that, it just adds that level of insurance that there's not something that you missed uh, in detail that uh, you probably should have picked up. So I think that's one. Um, and then in philanthropy, one thing that's worked for us that I would uh, ask housing authorities to think about, because we had, we had no particular you know, angst about it, um, naming conventions. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. someone will give you a check for philanthropy to help you close the deal, put their name in the building. What difference does it make? You're getting the, you're getting the deal. So I don't know what you found, but that's been some of the things that, that work for us. I, f I would always say that as more and more um, communities and localities and partners are looking at trying to address the affordable housing issues, these regional and local kind of housing funds are That's really cool. being developed yeah. across the country. Um, the Good idea point. that of uh, understanding that there is, needs to be a local response um, in terms of uh, accumulating resources to address affordable housing and having the housing authority at the table as an instrumental partner there is not only important because as I said before, the housing authority a lot of time is the largest landlord, but also too being at the table, you looking at your resources and what you can bring to the table to also helps you make sure that you can also uh, take advantage of those other resources that your other partners are bringing to the table in a meaningful way. Now, let's dive a little deeper with a question and answer discussion. 
All right, guys. Thank you so much for that. Really great conversation there. Uh, we're going to put a pin um, in the conversation regarding viability and feasibility uh, and pick that back up in February. Our next episode will air on February 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern as well. Um, but before we let the panelists go, I do want to bring them in for a question and answer period. Uh, we have Celia, Jim, and Lily here. Um, and we did get some questions already, but I want to remind those out there, if they'd like to ask some questions right now, you can use the tool itself. You may need to expand that out, but there's a question box. Feel free to send those in. Um, Celia, I have a, a first question for you. Although I'm getting a little feedback on your line, if there's a way perhaps to uh, lower your volume. You know what, Celia, I'll let you fix that for a moment. Lily, I'm going to jump to you. Uh, and the first question here is, what are some of the downfalls or pitfalls to potentially partnering on a development deal? Lily, are you there? All right, while we get Lily back, Jim, are you there? Absolutely. Um, do you want me to address the question? Yeah, you, more, please, go right ahead. So um, what we found in Nashville, uh, you have two completely conceptually different approaches. All your partners are going to be profit driven, whereas uh, virtually everything we do is mission driven. So one of the downsides of bringing in the partner is you've got to you're going to it's going to cost you some money. So make sure that you're very clear and about that up and up front and that uh, it's an open book approach and you have a solid knowledge of how much profit they're taking out of a job. Um, I was just in a, a national seminar last week and the private uh, public private partnership section section was advertising about 12% as their developer fee uh, for being a private partner. So that's one downside. Uh, second is um, they're going to be probably a little bit more efficient in some ways than, uh, than your staff may be. And their knowledge depth will be um, uh, probably deeper because that's what they do all the time. Whereas this may be one that you do every three or four years in a, in a large scale development. Um, so make sure that you get them to slow down and explain everything. Um, and if you don't understand it, uh, hold them up so that so that you can understand it. So I'd say those are the two. There's going to be some money involved uh, that if you did it yourself, you wouldn't you recapitalize that into your own organization. And two, they're going to be specialists and quite good and move fast. You just got to be ready to kind of catch them, explain things to you, so they don't move too fast for you. Uh, maybe have uh, decision points past you that were yours to make and not theirs. Yeah, great. That's really great stuff. Thank you for that. Um, Celia, if you're there, um, I'd like to address, uh, have you address this question that came in. Um, the question is, I'm a PHA administrator. What are some easy ways for me to leverage my assets? Hi. Um, Hi. So, yeah, I'm so glad I fixed the feedback problem. <laughs> so it's a PHA administrator from a PHA administration perspective. I'm trying to make sure. Correct. I That's what we have here. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, from a PHA administration perspective, maybe some easy ways, some brief, some a couple um, to leverage their assets. Well, one, um, as we discussed a little bit um, in the recording, um, and that is. For a lot of um, jurisdictions, the housing authority has the ability to be the bonding a bond issuer, and and, and that in that issuing ability uh, comes with um, a, a revenue generation activity of basically being the bond issuer. So there's a cost associated with that for folks who are going to be utilizing um, that resource. Another way to kind of look at the housing authority's um, assets um, and the when we were building affordable housing um, uh, many moons ago, uh, we we would build affordable housing with a lot of excess land. Um, you know, as as development activity and you know site plans and setbacks and zoning had changed over years, there are a lot of times the the amount of um, underutilized land around a housing authority asset could actually be utilized um, for other purposes, which is which are revenue generating. And we've actually worked with a, a couple of housing authorities across the country that have looked at some of their uh, underlying assets as a way to do some dispositions that are kind of, that create some revenue activity they can then um, uh, infuse into their development activity of the actual sites that they own. Um, another, 
I think the one more I would uh, look at is, uh, again, the Housing Authority partnering um, um, with certain entities because of them as an actual uh, partner in some of the ownership um, ownership structures that allows for certain um, uh, real estate tax exemption abatement and pilots um, that normally would not be afforded to um, that development. Um, and there could be some revenue generation for purposes of those partnerships. Uh, interesting stuff, Celia. Celia, I want to stay on you real quickly because we did get another question that came in regarding something you briefly mentioned on there. Uh, it, it's a basic question, but can you briefly explain what the benefit is to a PHA issuing a bond? So, um, you know, there's uh, every state um, gets a certain amount of uh, tax exempt bond uh, cap um, that they're that they have, and then through uh, you know a process where. Um, entities are um, can be assigned to to also issue those taxes and bonds. So, if those who are familiar at all with you know working with you know the the uh, their municipal partner or um, uh, city doing bonds for schools or roads or maybe even. Um, their housing finance agency, when they issue tax exempt bonds, as the issuer, there is a transactional cost to the end user um, uh, that is built into the transaction for the cost of issuing those bonds. So a lot of it does cover, you know, the amount of third party um, um, third party reports and other kind of uh, service professional services that are uh, connected to issuing bonds but mm -hmm. if you look at any sources and uses there's always kind of like issuing costs there and a lot of that issuing cost is really a payment to the bond issuer themselves gotcha thank you for that lily have you been able to rejoin us here are you able to hear me i am i am welcome back okay lily. good good um, i'm great. not sure what happened there but here yeah. i am not a problem. I do want to direct this question to you, though. Uh, talking about, you mentioned something um, in the show about projections. Uh, the question here is, how far out should my pro uh, my projections go when analyzing development deals? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think in terms of your actual funding applications that you're submitting, most sources will request at least 10 years, um, and often you'll see that they're requesting 30 years. Um, so I would say, you know, at a bare minimum, I w you would want to be running your cash flow through a 15-year period, um, and ideally for that for that full 30-year period. Um, and a lot of it is dependent on your financing structure too, of you know when your um, loans that you're seeking and when your investments that you're seeking on the property, what the timing horizon of those are. Um, so that's where you get that typical 15 year is the is the compliance period on the tax credits with the initial investor. So that drives a lot of the projections that you do, and then oftentimes loans will be amortizing on a 30 year um, or 30 to 40 year period. So um, it while it hinges upon the financing, I think looking at that scale is a good starting place. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Lily. And just a reminder to those out there, we're just going to keep the panelists around for just a little bit longer here. If you do have any last minute questions, please feel free to submit them using the question box within the tool. Um, and with that, Jim, we did get one question. Uh, someone wanted to know um, the, what was effective for you when you were shifting your culture uh, at your organization to thinking long term rather than short term? Maybe some advice toward that. Well, you can't communicate enough, so over communicate. Um, I think my staff's probably tired of it almost, but that's what you've got to do. So we hold we hold all hands meetings. I call them all hands meetings and split the organization in half, typically on a Thursday, Friday, and uh, we'll shut down one. So the offices all stay open, but they're half staffed, and half come and meet with me on Thursday, and I lay out where we're going, what we're doing, and answer questions. Everybody from a groundskeeper up to you know, the deputy executive director, and then I bring the other half in on Friday. So I'd say over communicate. Uh, second, get on top of your processes. For us, uh, we made some pretty significant process changes that push decision making authority uh, down farther. So I, I actually created a thing called an authority mandate, where in writing I released things that I've been signing and things I was accountable for uh, and remained accountable for, but I, I delegated the responsibility down. 
So it empowered the subordinates to a degree. Um, and then we went really heavy with an IT company out of uh, Silicon Valley that created uh, database, uh, they said database web, database cloud-based uh, web tool that allowed everybody to see pretty much everything that was going on. So you could see the financials on the property. You could see what the loans were. You could see what our bond issuance was, where we stood on, on our overall debt to uh, loan, loan to value, debt to value, um, number of vouchers we had in the street. So we had a, a, a very comprehensive uh, informational tool built that everybody could plug into and see what's going on. So I think, but the main one is you just got to talk. You got to communicate, communicate, communicate. <laughs> Always a great uh, tip, and thank you for sharing that. And uh, uh, Jim, we actually did get one last question in for you. Uh, the question is to uh, potentially discuss uh, displacement. Um, how does your organization supervise eviction, non-renewals, and ensure that low-income tenants um, are being protected? Okay, well, I'll deal with those in two separate um, parts. Uh, first of all, all housing authorities, and especially us, we are not in the eviction business. We're in the resident business. So our evictions, uh, we are very cautious about. Most are economic. We have a handful that are criminal, uh, but that's just part of property management. And we follow the law and work close to the sheriff and give uh, our residents every opportunity they can to make up any shortfalls in finances. And we have four nonprofits that assist us with it. And we have a financial empowerment center. Typically, we're able to resolve a lot of these just by getting people on a straight and narrow budget that they sign up for with the repayment schedule structured out. So that's that's property management operations 101. Uh, we do not displace, and when, when we build, it is painful to do that in terms of property management. But what we do is we project how many units we need to clear because uh, where we're building, people are living in buildings built in 1937, 1941. So we figure out that that's say we'll just use a notional number. We have to move 100 residents out of a three-block area that we're going to recapitalize and rebuild in a year and a half. In that overall development, we stop filling vacancies and we leave apartments open, which means we have to really stay on top of security because an empty apartment can be a magnet for uh, things that you don't want to have happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when time comes, we don't put people off site. We move them from the area being uh, recapitalize on the same site in the open apartments across uh, the remaining apartments. It slows down our development, frankly, but, uh, and if we were developers, we wouldn't do it this way, but we're, our first goal is to make the lives better for our residents and increase the inventory of low-income housing um, without messing up the lives of our residents. Most of our residents of low-income have very important social networks for them and their children, generally with other residents. And if you start fooling around with that too much, you really can you really destroy some lives. So um, we're pretty proud, uh, not dancing in the end zone because we got a long way to go to finish what we're doing. But we've uh, let's see, I think the number is 267 families have been relocated on site at Envision Casey uh, without being dislocated off the site. Um, now they move from an old apartment to an old apartment, but as the new apartments come online, they're the first ones into the new apartments. So I hope that answers the question. So we, we do our best not to displace anyone. And thank you for sharing that, Jim. Um, and, that, and that's a nice positive way to end the Q&A uh, portion of the segment. Again, I want to remind those out there, we will be continuing conversations with Lily, Jim, and Celia on February 19th at 2 p.m. Eastern. We have two more episodes after that for season one of this of the practitioner's view on housing development. Um, I suggest that for those that want to check out previous episodes with other panelists and uh, folks sharing their experience to check out HEI Group's online training platform. You can catch the previous episodes, the question and answers period, and some exclusive bonus footage on there. Um, I want to thank the panelists for uh, their insights today. I hope you out there are able to take something away from this. And again, thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Housing is a fundamental need indeed, and we thank our guests for sharing their insights on how they are actively working to construct more of it. Please check out other episodes of this series as we continue to explore the journey. This has been Housing Development, a Practitioner's View.